Hi, I'm Lisa Van Gammer. Thank you so much for joining me. I am talking today about homeschooling. Now, there are a couple of other questions I'm going to be answering, but I've gotten a couple of homeschooling questions lately. So tonight's office hours are going to focus on that. I will take questions in the chat. So whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, feel free. Didn't hear the stop. Okay. Do it, maybe. <laughs> My husband said you couldn't hear the start. So hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Van Gammer. Um, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, I can see both. Um, so I want to start with homeschooling in general. And I think it's important for you to understand my perspective about homeschooling, because you may not think I have the perspective I do being a professional educator. So I think a lot of people expect me to be kind of anti-homeschooling or skeptical of homeschooling because I am a teacher. However, I homeschooled my kids for a few years when we lived in Germany. And so I've been a homeschooling parent. And and because of that, I feel like, and a classroom teacher as well. So I feel like because of that, I have a well-rounded view of it. So I have a few thoughts about homeschooling in general that I want to start with. And then I'm going to share some of the specific questions that I got and answers to them. Again, if you have any questions about homeschooling or any other issue, please feel free to throw it in the chat. So homeschooling in general, and I'm particularly focusing on gifted kids because that's my area of expertise. But I think that the number one thing I would say about homeschooling is that it works best when it's proactive, not reactive. What I mean by that is when somebody decides to homeschool because they've thought through all the different educational options and have decided that this is what's best for their family rather than reactive. And by reactive, I mean you've got a kid in school and you're clashing with teachers or the student isn't able to get along with other kids or you have some problem in school and you decide to react by pulling them out of school and homeschooling. That to me typically doesn't go as well. So I'll give you an example of why we decided to homeschool. So I was living in Germany, as I mentioned. Now in Germany, uh, homeschooling is not legal. However, we were covered under the status of forces agreement because we were there as under the Department of Defense. And so we were allowed to homeschool there. Um, and I decided to because we lived about a half an hour away from the American school. And I had younger children who would have spent like three and a half or four hours a day in a car getting older siblings to and from school. I decided because I knew we were only going to be there for a few years that attending the German school was not something I wanted to do because I had a son who was in first grade and I didn't want him learning to read and write in German and not in English. And I didn't want him to have to come home and do extra school while I taught him to read in English. I just felt like that was going to be too much. If he had, if we had been planning on staying in Germany, I would have absolutely had him in the German school. And I had friends who put their kids in German school and had great experiences. But for us, I decided because I knew that we'd be coming back to the United States when he was in third or fourth grade, that it was going to be important for him to have English as his main language of reading and writing. So I decided that the drive wasn't going to be a good fit, especially because in Germany, of course, we're encountering weather. So in the winter. So we decided to homeschool and I homeschooled while we lived there and it was a great experience. I have a lot of positive things about it. So I think that when it's a proactive choice, right, then then it's a good choice. If it's reactive, it can still work, but it's not as seamless. And so a lot of people think that when they leave school, they're going to leave all the problems that they had at school. That's not necessarily true, especially if the child is struggling socially or emotionally at school. A lot of that's going to come home into the home and can actually be exacerbated in the home because whereas before they may have struggled in school, but home was a place of safety. Now they're struggling in school, but the school is home. And so now home is a place of contention. Um, it also puts, I mean, let's be honest, homeschooling takes time. If done well, it takes time. That means that um, you've, you've got to have the financial assets to make it work. It means that typically one parent is going to be the homeschooling parent. It takes a teacher, right? It takes a teacher. And so 
um, even if you're not an educated teacher, like meaning that you don't have a degree in it or whatever, um, it still takes someone guiding that instruction. And a lot of people believe that computer programs can replace that, but I, I don't believe that. So I think that one thing I should maybe warn you about, if especially if you don't know me, I speak the truth as I know it. And so I don't really worry about whether I'm going to offend someone. I don't really worry about whether people are going to agree or disagree with me. I do a lot of research and I have a lot of experience and I speak from that research and that experience. And so if people don't like what I have to say, that's fine. You don't have to accept it, but I am going to say what I, what I believe to be true. And what I believe to be true is that putting a kid in front of computer apps and programs all day is suboptimal emphasis on sub. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's developmentally appropriate. I think it's bad for their eyes. I think it encourages lots of bad habits. And I, I think that if your choice is to have a kid at home just working on a screen in isolation or at school, I would 100% put them at school 100% of the time. Next, I don't think that either homeschooling or traditional schooling are inherently better or worse. And I would say the same thing about the difference between public school and charter school. I don't think that either one of them is inherently better or worse. It goes by the individual school, the individual homeschool, the individual charter school. You can't paint any one system with a brush. I get so annoyed when I see people on Twitter saying things like, I never learned anything at school or school is completely broken. I'm like, really? And are you a teacher, right? Like what, what exactly, how exactly do you know this? So I don't think that anyone is inherently better or worse. You can't just say that I'm homeschooling and ergo that is de facto better than traditional schooling. That's just simply not the case. Often, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of times people who are homeschooling, and I noticed this in my homeschool group that I was in, and we were in like a homeschool co-op that I was in when I was homeschooling. A lot of times homeschoolers think that their kids are way more ahead than they are. And right now, all of these scenarios are floating through my mind, memories I've had of conversations. Um, I had a friend who was homeschooling and who had a son who was in seventh grade, and her belief was that he was very, very, very advanced. I asked to see some of the work. I was curious, what does a very advanced homeschooling seventh grader um, do, produce, and look like? Because my children were significantly younger when we were homeschooling. And I was absolutely stunned because the child was doing work that I would have done some intervention on in my third graders. Like that the work was lacking quality that I would have expected in a third grader. And so I think sometimes there can be be a lack of understanding of exactly where we are. I, I do think that state standards differ from state to state, but if you're going to homeschool, it's important to look at what those standards are. And it, they're hard to read if you're not trained to read them. They can be hard to read if you are trained to read them, but they can be hard to read and understand exactly what's going on here. Um, but the fact is, is that the odds that the child is significantly ahead of what they're encountering in the public school are are not a guarantee. Homeschooling does not necessarily guarantee that. And, and oftentimes, if you talk to classroom teachers, they will tell you students who are coming into a traditional classroom who've been homeschooled are often behind, not ahead. So it's not always the case, right? And especially when we're talking about gifted kids, not always the case. But as a classroom teacher, I would say well over 50% of the students coming in from homeschooling has, has had struggles of some kind um, with content, not just social emotional, but with content. There'll be, I hate the word gap, it's so overused, but there will be gaps. There'll be something that we studied that they just didn't have, and yet it's in our curriculum, and so it's an expectation that they know it. It could be something that happened years ago, right? It could be something that was taught in second grade and now it's recursive and we're seeing it again in fifth grade. Next, um, there is a myth that a ton of time in traditional school is taken up with stupid stuff. And so homeschooling only takes a fraction of the time that somehow like moving from class to class or packing up your backpack takes tons of time or going to the bathroom or going to the cafeteria. But I would say that like kids at home I have distractions that kids at school don't have. 
I would also say that that's just not true. I mean, what happens is, is that when you try to pull the work out, when all you try to take out of traditional school is to extract work, like worksheets and practice and reading, that's going to take less time, but that's not all that they're doing in school. There's also a lot of discussion going on, a lot of group interaction, a lot of other activities that are being done that can't be replicated in something that is sent home. And so I think that that's probably one of the biggest myths that people who homeschool have about traditional school is that traditional school is just some big time waster and that out of you know a seven hour instructional day, they're only getting two hours of actual learning. Um, that That's just simply not true if, if for the most part, right? I guess you could have a super terrible school, but I've taught in multiple schools, myriad grade levels and content areas, and I've not seen that. So I think that that is a problem. There's a lot of social emotional learning that's going on in school that isn't always going on in home at home. And even when I'm a classroom teacher and I have to send makeup work home for a student who's absent, yeah, that makeup work's gonna take a lot less time to do, but that's not because we were doing a bunch of busy work. That's because I can't recreate the power that was going on in my classroom in something that you can do at home. Next, I think that two of the things that if you're homeschooling, you have to guard against is that there can be a lack of the high quality discussion and the high quality writing that you're going to get in school. So we're writing across the curriculum in traditional school now. So we're writing in science and we're writing in social studies as well as language arts. And one of the things I see with homeschoolers is just not enough quality writing, more writing, more writing, do more writing. Interestingly, a lot of students who end up getting reactionarily homeschooled, and by that I mean like being pulled out of traditional school as a reaction to an unpleasant experience in traditional school, it's a resistance to writing. And so when they get home, the parent doesn't want to have that battle either. But writing must happen, and a lot of it. Secondly, discussion. This is one of the reasons why plugging a kid in front of a computer won't work. It doesn't work in traditional school and it doesn't work in homeschool. And I object to it, whether it's done in traditional school or homeschool. I've written about how computer learning programs are insufficient differentiation for gifted children on my website. I've written about that already. Um, but I would say that it, it lacks the power of good quality discussion. I mean, I have a course on questioning. If you're a homeschooler, you could take that questioning course and learn how to be a good questioner and engage in questioning with a student. But if you're not having discussions about learning, quality discussions about learning, not just what did you learn today, but quality discussion about the content itself, then it is an inadequate education. I know that's a powerful statement, but I think it's true. And I think it's one of the key things that's lacking. Next, I, I get a lot of questions about how do you pick a homeschool curriculum? And I think that you pick a curriculum in a similar way that you would pick a diet. So a lot of curriculum works. A lot of curriculum is great, just like a lot of diets work and a lot of diets are great. The one that works is the one you'll do, right? So if, I mean, obviously there's gonna be quality in different things, but I would say that in general, pick a curriculum that fits your child and fits your family. Now, the idea of learning styles that some kids are visual learners, auditory learners, or kinesthetic learners has been completely debunked. That is bad neuroscience. It's a total myth. People always get mad at me when they hear me say this until they go Google it and find out I'm right. Um, and I didn't make this research up. I mean, no, it's, uh, other people have done this research so that I can say the idea of learning styles is a myth. Um, and so you don't need to worry about that. But there are going to be kids who prefer like lots of graphics, kids who prefer shorter lessons, kids who prefer no graphics or a longer lesson. You, you may want to do certain things. You may have emphasis on certain topics. There are lots of different things that go into picking homeschool curriculum. I would say read loads and loads of reviews 
go to an actual physical brick and mortar store that carries curriculum and look at it, um, read recommendations and be ready to spend a lot of money. Um, quality homeschool materials are not cheap. Uh, curriculum is expensive to produce. So I will tell you what I used. Now, uh, this is not an endorsement. They don't know I'm saying this. Um, I'll just tell you what I used. So I used a curriculum when I was homeschooling. I used a curriculum called Sunlight, S-O-N. It's a Christian-based curriculum. I didn't choose it for its Christian basis, although I am a Christian. I chose it because it was specifically designed for people who weren't living in the United States. So in, in the science lessons, it had a lot of experimentation, which I really liked. And if you needed a Q-tip, a battery, and a paper clip for the experiment, they included a Q-tip, a battery, and a paper clip. And that was very helpful to me because living in Germany, I didn't have access to the same things that I could buy in the United States. Like they didn't have Walmart, right? So I couldn't just run down to Walmart and get this. I lived in a, in a small village that, you know, we had a little tiny grocery store the size of a 7-Eleven. And so I didn't have access to that. So I liked Sunlight for that. The other thing I really like about Sunlight is that they integrate the language arts and the social studies so like for, for third grade, I'm going to be reading about American history in like, I'm using that in my language arts and my social studies, which that's the way I like to teach as a teacher. So in high school, I teach language arts and social studies. In elementary school, I teach self-contained all content areas. So language arts, social studies, math and science, all the same group of kids all day in my same classroom. So that's how I teach when I am a classroom teacher in elementary school. In high school, I teach only language arts and social studies. And I like the integration of language arts and social studies. So I like that. The math curriculum I used is called Saxon, S-A-X-O-N. It is still available. I like Saxon for a couple of reasons. And I've used Saxon as a homeschool parent and I've used Saxon as a classroom teacher. I've also used Scott Forsman as a classroom teacher and a couple of other math curriculums as well. I like Saxon for three reasons. The first reason I like Saxon is the morning meeting. Saxon starts each day with this kind of repetitive practice of concepts. And I find that very useful. Um, every day it incrementally moves them along, but it's great review. It's great retrieval practice. The second thing is Saxon integrates geometry from the beginning. So they don't wait until like, you know, 10th grade to get geometry or whatever, right? We're getting geometry from the beginning, geometric principles in the beginning. It also, I guess this is like reason 2.1, is that it relies on a lot of manipulatives um, in the early grades, which I find helpful for all students. The third thing I like about Saxon is that it is a complete curriculum. Curriculum that ends at like sixth grade that only works through sixth grade is not that useful to me. So I like curriculum that I can take all the way through where I need. Um, so I like I like Saxon. However, if I didn't like Saxon, if Saxon didn't work for me, I might choose Matthew C or Singapore Math. Singapore Math, I think, only goes through sixth grade. It Matthew C is very much like manipulative based, um, a, a lot of people, especially if you have students who struggle with conceptual math, uh, would do well with Matthew C. Singapore math um, is a very different program, but all three of those, Saxon, Singapore, Matthew C, any of those are ones that I would feel perfectly comfortable using in my own homeschool. Um, for language arts, well, I like the integration of language arts and social studies. So for reading, I'm going to pick books and I tend to skew classics. And a, a lot of people will push back against that now, right? Um, push back kind of against our literary canon. But I I don't find their arguments compelling. Um, I, I like classic literature. I like the Caldecott winners for younger students, Newbery winners for older students. Um, I, awards don't mean everything, but they do mean something. And those high quality awards are very useful. You can find other award programs that may be books you like that, you know, the type of book you're looking for. But I would use good quality literature. Don't, don't 
ignore nonfiction and poetry. And that's another mistake I see a lot of homeschoolers making now is that they think that what reading is, is just fiction, but in, and just one genre of fiction, which is prose. But in traditional school, we're teaching students nonfiction analysis and poetry analysis at very young grades. So you can't leave that out. They need to be reading nonfiction and they need to be reading poetry at very young ages. So I don't have a strong curriculum recommendation for language arts um, other than the one I used, which I was very happy with, except for one thing. I do think it is critically important that students have a strong handwriting curriculum. The one I recommend is handwriting without tears. So handwriting without tears is very good. Students must learn to write and they must learn cursive. And if you start, if you teach Danelian printing, it will be easier for students to move into a cursive handwriting. But I think that too few people emphasize handwriting. It's unemphasized in traditional school now to our shame and discredit. And it's and it's not emphasized enough in homeschool as well. So, um, and there's a little recommendation for you. I, I'm not familiar with Ambleside, so I'd have to, you know, look at it. But I think what you're looking for in language arts curriculum is full length text. If all you're getting is excerpts, I would not agree with that. So you want to make sure that students are reading full length text. Now, if you're looking at a first grader, you're not going to have like long books, right? But second grade, I'm going to want longer. I'm going to want full, like, you know, a little chapter book. Um, by third grade, I want them reading quality novels and the entire novel. So I would not agree with any curriculum that doesn't have full length novels by third grade. Um, next, I'm going to answer a question. So those are just my general thoughts about homeschooling overall. Um, and yeah, Teacher Likes Book says Saxon is scripted, so it would be a decent choice for non-teachers. That is a really good point. I didn't add that as something that is a pro for me for Saxon, mostly because I'm a teacher, right? So um, so that <laughs> um, I, I'm a teacher, so I don't need the script. However, it is helpful. And so, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you so much for that. And then Danielle says, we use handwriting without tears in our TK classes. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, handwriting without tears is really good. It's actually really quite good for students who struggle with pen holding and pencil holding. If you are homeschooling, here's another tip. If you are homeschooling, make at least one appointment, even if you just go one time, make an appointment with an occupational therapist to make sure that your child has a, an appropriate and, and quality pencil grip. If you don't fix that, then the child will get tired holding a pencil. If you don't hold a pencil correctly, um, by the age of six, it's hard to fix. It's hard to fix after the age of six. And if you don't hold a pencil correctly, then your hand will get tired when you write. If your hand gets tired when you write, you will be resistant to writing. And that is problematic both in traditional school and in homeschool. You guys, I'm so much more comfortable when I have a pencil in my hand. Like I, I thrive on pens and pencils. So Ticonderoga pencils for the win. No pencil beats a Ticonderoga. And then my pen of choice, which is the Energel, the heavy weight one. I love it so much. Okay, so um, those are those are my those are my general recommendations. Now let me get into a couple of the specific questions that I've received about homeschooling. Here's one: My seven-year-old is a homeschooled kid with math reading in the 99th percentile. She is advanced in math, doing fifth grade and language arts, fourth grade. I am interested in getting her tested so I can meet her academic needs through online gifted academies. I can't afford expensive testing just yet, but don't want her to lose interest or time because of my lack of resources. What would you suggest? Okay. So first of all, I think I've already said, if you didn't hear the answer to this, I don't like online gifted academies. <laughs> um, I don't like stuff that's all online. I don't think that all online is a good choice. Um, I know that there are schools that are all online. I, and if that's all that's possible, if for some reason 
the parent is completely incapacitated or it might be a choice if a teacher is a non-English speaker like and the child needs to learn English or let's say you're German and the child in and like you live in Germany but you don't speak German and you want your child to speak German then maybe but other than that I don't I don't I think there is a strong place for analog kids need to write with the pen kids need to read not on a device um, kids need to interact with people face to face. This is how the brain works. And I've read all of the research I can find. I've read everything I can find on this. I read so many peer reviewed journal articles on this. And I have yet to read anything that would persuade me that as of yet, we can substitute the, the quality of face to face education completely virtually. So I would reject the idea of an online gifted academy. Now, as a supplement, great. As part of a learning program, okay. As the whole learning, that would not be my first choice or third choice or eighth choice. Um, okay, I wanna talk about MAP. Okay, this parent says, my seven-year-old is a homeschooled kid with MAP readings in the 99th left percentile. Okay, so if you're not familiar with MAP testing, first of all, as a caveat, I think you all know that I'm not a huge, um, I'm not a huge uh, believer in MAP testing in general. I'm not a huge believer in a lot of standardized achievement tests. Um, it's too conflated with other issues. Okay, so um, how MAP testing works though, in general, and, and MAP testing is tricky because people get given different types of mass testing, MAP testing. You can have MAP tests that are done in 45 minutes. You can, there, there's not a time limit, so a kid could take a long time. MAP testing is incrementalized. So how it works is it's not criterion referenced. What I mean by that is when a student takes, when a student takes MAP testing it's on a computer, and if they answer a question correctly, they get a harder question. If they answer a question incorrectly, they get an easier question. And so you get a percentile score based on other kids in that age or grade level. I find it problematic. I find it problematic because it can't test, particularly in language arts, it cannot test true analysis. It, it can't test some it, and it can't test writing so it's not testing writing so to say that a child is functioning at two or three grade levels ahead in language arts based on a map score alone is impossible there's no way to test that um and so there's no way it's testing it because you would need it's subjective writing is subjective you would need to submit a writing sample and have it scored and map scores are generated instantly so i i take map test scores with a, a, a tablespoon of salt. Um, I would for sure want an abilities test as well. And, it, and the thing is, is that you have to make sure that testing is being done objectively, right? So if you're, that's one of the challenges with homeschooling. It can be overcome, but it is a challenge with homeschooling is how do you get your child assessed? Because if you're giving the assessment, there's bias built in. So you're going to need to find out, will your school district administer testing? If they do, great. Um, and see if they'll give an abilities test. I'd want an abilities test. Always, I'd want an abilities test to go along with any achievement test. Um, with math, uh, uh, what math testing is looking for, uh, let me mention this as well. Math testing is actually more about the school than it is about the child. Map testing is looking for growth. How much did this kid grow? And it's particularly problematic with gifted kids. If you go on their website of this company that's making hundreds of millions of dollars off of this test, keep in mind, these tests are not morally neutral. These are companies making big money. Testing kids is big business. Now, I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing this company. They're just a company like any other. What I'm saying is that they're not they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts with the best interests of kids in mind. It's a company in the same way that Target may have clothes you like, but they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Right. They're trying to make money. 
So um, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that you have to be honest with yourself and understand what is going on in this in this field, right? Okay, so it's it's trying to measure growth. And if you look at the company's website, they will admit that they they don't do a good job, really. They don't, well, they wouldn't say they don't do a good job. What would they say? They would say, I think their wording is that it doesn't show growth as well or as accurately in high ability kids. So that's no surprise, right? But you'll see like all this growth for a kid on level or below level, but then you get this high ability kid and they just, the mean growth is like so much lower. You can go look at it. It's on their website, right? I've read all of this. Um, and it's, so that's problematic. So the map test itself, I need to set aside as saying that's not enough. I would want a Kogat or an Olsat, not an Aglieri, too short, um, and not a Riles, like none of those. I want an Olsat or a Kogat or a full scale IQ test. Now, if somebody really wants a full scale IQ and they don't have a lot of money, one thing you can try is to see if you live near a university that has a PhD program in psychology. If so, you will have PhD students who have to practice administering IQ tests under supervision of a professor. And they often will do it for a very, very nominal cost. Now, are they going to be used to gifted? No, not really, unless it's a gifted ed psych program, which is so rare. Um, but they, so they're not going to be used to gifted necessarily. Are they going to be experts at it? No, but they're going to have a lot going for them, right? They're young in, in the sense of young in the field, meaning that their knowledge is fresh. Um, they are working under a seasoned professional who's been doing this for a long time and has a lot of experience. They want to do it well because they're trying to get their own certifications and licensure. So that is one thing to check into if you want to get her tested, but you can't afford expensive testing. See if you have a university nearby. Um, but I would say that you don't need expensive stuff. And for um, like minded kids, I would say that you gifted kids, one of the big assets of gifted kids is that they don't have to hang around other kids their age. So what I would do is I would be interest based rather than school based or age based. And what I mean by that is what's the child interested in? The, the pronoun used is she. So I'll assume it's your daughter. So is she interested in model trains? Then I would have her join a model train society. Is she interested in um, in whatever culture you are? Then I would have her join cultural organizations. There's scouting. There's library. You know, there's book clubs. Maybe you can start a book club. I have an article on my website about how to start a book club for kids. I would be more interest-based. Um, museum programs. Um if you live in, um, like, depending on where you live, what's available there? Are there mountains? Are there national parks? Look around to see what you have that she's interested in. Look to see what's available at local colleges, junior colleges, um, universities, whatever you have nearby. But I would be interest-based and not age-based. Um, I would never rely on map testing. I just want to go back and say this. And it's not just map testing. I'm not bad mouthing map testing. I would feel the same about any achievement test. Um, Woodcock Johnson achievement, any achievement test. Um, CTBS that I took when I was growing up. ITBS, any, any achievement test. I'm going to take with a grain of salt, right? It's what the kid looked like on that day, on that particular test. And the same is true of abilities testing. So I'm never going to look at one test as something. Um, enrichment. When I'm seeing in the in the comments, um, I mean as an enrichment, and so I think again you're going to find like-minded kids in the environment, right? So if you have a kid who's obsessed with paleontology, you're going to find like-minded kids at the museum. Um, okay, so next question: Child is eight and in second grade. 
has really struggled this past year with traditional school, been at a private school. She's been so bored to the point that she's hating school and developed a lot of anxiety around going. I recently pulled her out of school and into a homeschool program because I need her to reset and hopefully develop a love of learning again. I have some flexibility now with her curriculum as I'm her teacher, essentially. We started Beast Academy Math because some of our gifted learner friends recommended it and she seems to like it. We'd love to pick your brain on any curriculum you think would help challenge her. Let me just address that one little curriculum piece real fast. I already talked about curriculum in the beginning. Um, Beast Math is a um, computer one. It's cute. Like it's like gamified. So yeah, a kid's going to like it. Do I like it? I haven't worked with it enough to know, but anything that's solely on the computer without discussion is not going to be my favorite. So, okay. Our goal for this school year is to come to a place where she loves learning again and to manage her anxiety. My goal is that she can be able to return to school, whether or not we actually do that. Time will tell if homeschool is something that she and I can handle. Right now it's a necessity, but hoping she can get back into school at some point because I work. So yeah, I don't want to spend a ton of time on homeschooling. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here and I'm a little bit worried that I'm going to offend this person. I believe, I said in the beginning, I don't care if I offend people, but I actually do. I mean, I know I offend people and I don't stop talking, but I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to ever offend anybody on purpose. Um, I believe the program the district offers is around two hours of work. Much of it is easy for her. They said they could approve some higher level curriculum first. So I'd love to substitute some for programs that would challenge her. For example, we are looking at Beast Academy math instead of the program they have. And this is the same person who said Beast Academy. Um, I would also like to have something in language arts that's more challenging. Yes, she, she started therapy a few weeks ago. And we plan to continue that. I appreciate any suggestions you have. All right. So let me share some thoughts about this. First of all, Working full time and homeschooling are not a great fit. Homeschooling, like people, people think that they can put their kid at a desk and have them just work on their own, essentially independent study and do whatever they were going to do and work. And that is not going to give your child an education. That may give them learning, but it's not going to give them an education. And it's definitely going to be subpar to what they would get in a traditional classroom. So because there they're going to have a teacher who is interacting with them. They're going to have other students who are interacting with them. Um, you're not going to build some of the real skills that are needed for success in school. There are social skills that are necessary for success in school, but also in like real life, the real world, right? You have to learn to get along with people. You can't, you don't want to turn a kid into the Unabomber because all they're used to is sitting in front of a computer by themselves doing nothing, right? Even those of us who work from home on computers are still interacting with people, right? Like my husband works from home as well. And I hear him in meetings all the time, right? He's with other people. And if you're not interacting with other people, it's a problem. So I'm, I'm concerned about, I don't want to spend a ton of time on homeschooling. I, that to me was like a big red flag waving. I, that worries me. That really worries me. That, this to me is reactionary homeschooling, which I talked about in the beginning. I'm not a fan of. I don't think that you typically solve problems by completely running from them, which is what's happened here. I don't think you're going to reset a student's love of learning when they're just engaged in a computer. Like, I don't, I don't see that happening. And I say this with all due respect, but this doesn't sound like an optimal solution to me. Um, the school's coursework only takes two hours because they can't recreate the stuff of real value. That's what you have to do. You take like what happens is parents get the work from the school and they set the kid down and they let the kid do it on their own. And then they say, oh, that only took two hours. Look how poor quality the stuff the school is doing is. What they don't understand is that in school, it took a lot longer because there was pausing. There was talking. There was working. There was revising. There was practice. All of this was going on. And so this that's problematic. Um, if the school district will give you higher level stuff, take it and see what happens. But you're going to have to engage. If you have to work, if you want to homeschool and you have to work, then my suggestion would be get together in a homeschool co-op and take turns teaching. Get if you get a big enough group, you might be able to like hire a retired teacher to do some teaching, but you've, you've got to have 
some real interaction. You cannot put, especially a second grader, um, just on their own in front of a computer. You're going to create some mental health issues that way. Like you're you're trying to solve them, but you're going to create them. You may solve one, but you didn't really solve it, right? You you just took away the stimulus. So that's problematic. Um, you know, I was going to come. Uh, okay, um, next. Uh, the, the word anxiety is problematic now. And the reason that the word anxiety is problematic now is because anxiety is an actual diagnosis. General, general anxiety disorder is diagnosis. A lot of people, they take their kid to a mental health professional and they get a diagnosis of anxiety and they think, oh, my kid has anxiety. And there are two issues with this. Number one, mental health professionals, if they're billing insurance, have to give a diagnosis. They have to. Otherwise, they can't bill the insurance, right? There has to be a diagnosis. So you're going to get a diagnosis because of that. So that's the problem. Number two, anxiety, like so many other things, is it comes in various forms. Even in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there are varying different forms of anxiety, not all created equal. And secondly, anxiety is not like you either have it or you don't. It's not a switch, right? Anxiety is a normal anxiety, nervousness, hesitance, reticence. We have a hundred words in English for it because it's normal. It's normal. And a, a lot of people think that if they feel nervousness, then there's something wrong with them. But the fact is, is that we all feel nervous. If you didn't feel nervous at all, you just like walk out in front of a car and get hit, right? Like you, we have to feel a little bit of nervousness. Nervousness keeps us from doing things that are dangerous to us. Now, sometimes kids do have anxiety disorders. It happens. Do as many kids have anxiety disorders as people are running around saying we have anxiety disorders? No. Do as many adults have anxiety disorders who are running around saying they have anxiety disorders? No. Um, sometimes kids have anxiety and sometimes they are recognizing what gets the parents going and anxiety gets the parents going. Kids throwing fits, kids crying, kids complaining, kids acting out in different ways awakens that protective nature in us. And it can then become very, very difficult, even for mental health professionals, to tease out what's really going on. Like, is the child really having an... an, an does the child really have a mental health condition or is the child conditioning to this mental health issue? Um, I'm going to come back to teacher likes books comments because it's really good, but I'm going to keep going with this. In this particular case, I would get, first of all, I would get Dan Peters books. So Dan Peters wrote a book called Making Your Warrior a Warrior for Parents. And he wrote a book called Taming the Worry Monster for Children. And there's a workbook as well. I would get Dan Peters stuff. I'm glad the child is in therapy as well. Um, but I would definitely work with Dan Peters stuff. I do not buy. I, I don't buy the sequence laid out here of boredom led to. Um, let's see, where was this? Boredom led to hating school that led to anxiety around going. I, I, lots of people are bored, but don't hate the thing. Like I, I can be bored at church and not hate church and not develop anxiety about going. I cannot want to go. I can, I can complain about it. I can wish it were different, but it, there's not a necessary step process there. I'm not saying that this child doesn't have anxiety. Obviously, I don't know this kid. And, and I'm not a mental health professional, so I couldn't diagnose them even if I did. But what I would say is, I don't think, I don't, I'm not comfortable saying that boredom is always going to lead to hating school, which is always going to lead to anxiety. So I'm not comfortable with that. And I'm not comfortable with backwards blaming either. There's no real way to know if the child has an anxiety disorder. There's no real way to know where it came from. Um, okay. I have more than that. I would say that I, I would get some good abilities or IQ testing done. I would get some good abilities testing done. So you know what you're working with, right? 
if a child was in second grade and was doing second grade level work, but was capable of fourth grade level work, yes, you're going to have boredom. And yes, that needs to be fixed. I'm not agreeing that it's going to cause anxiety disorder, but I do agree it needs to be addressed, right? I don't want a kid sitting bored all day long, no matter what the effect is. Next, I, so I would get a good ability test done. I don't see how this plan in place of like, we're going to pull her out of school. We're going to homeschool, but homeschooling means she's just kind of on her own because I don't have a lot of time for it. I don't see how that's going to create a love of learning. I, I'm missing that piece. And again, these were just emails. So I think maybe I, it just wasn't included. I'm not saying the parents not doing that. I'm just saying I'm not I'm not seeing how this plan does it. And I think I think the parent realizes that, which is why they're reaching out. They're like, I'm not I think the parent is an intelligent, well-meaning, good quality parent who is seeing that this plan isn't necessarily going to lead to the child isn't necessarily on the path that's going to lead where they want. Truthfully, I'd look for a better school fit for her. So maybe Montessori, although in the interest of full disclosure, a lot of gifted kids, Montessori can drive them bonkers. They want more structure. Um, but a lot of gifted kids thrive in Montessori because it is more self-paced. Um, especially if you can get a multi-grade Montessori classroom. So then there's some, some space there. The quality of the materials in Montessori, true Montessori classrooms, the quality of materials is often really wonderful for that tactile nature of gifted kids. And Montessori fulfills all of my analog dreams, right? Um, I would make sure, I would try a school that offers visiting for a day or two and, and have an honest conversation with what the school district offers. Look at acceleration, although you're going to need to address those mental health issues. A child who is struggling with anxiety or anxious behavior, nervous behavior, resistant behavior isn't probably ready for acceleration, um, which is a shame because acceleration is probably the easiest answer to the boredom problem, um, which is one of the reasons why early intervention is important. Next, I would say make sure this child is getting tons and tons and tons of social interaction. Okay, teachers likes books. I want to go back to your comment here. A school classroom environment can also provide quality feedback. Yes. Peer review and self-evaluation all facilitate learning that can also be missing in homeschool. 100%. 100%. Totally agree with you. All right. Next question. This isn't specifically about homeschooling. Um, I'm, I have two questions now to wrap up tonight that are about kids, but not necessarily homeschooling. So the first one was, what do you do with a lazy gifted kid? Well, um, first of all, there's a lot of questions to ask before this question can be answered. The first one is, are we demotivating them? Are we allowing them to be addicted to devices? Do they have unfettered access to games? on their devices? Are they on their phones all the time? Um, that's going to be demotivating. They're not going, like gaming is specifically designed to make you want to do that and nothing else, like any addiction. So if the game, if the kid only wants to play video games, then that's just a sign that the video game was designed as it was supposed to be. And that means that you're you've got a kid who's not going to want to do anything else because the game did what it was designed to do, which was make the kid not want to do anything else. So I, the, the number one thing I say when people say a kid is lazy is to say, how much video gaming are they allowed to do? If it's more than like half an hour a day, I would say fix that and then come back and let's talk some more because that's like one of the main issues. Next, are there executive function issues in place? Sometimes laziness isn't laziness. Sometimes laziness is a lack of an executive function skill. Executive function is managing our time, our materials, and our emotions. So sometimes a lazy gifted kid is having trouble managing their emotions. Um, you know, we all feel that way, right? We all feel like we have things we need to do, but we don't want to do. That's a normal human condition, a normal human feeling. How do we address that? Well, in any of the ways that we would address it in adults. For instance, I need to clean my windows outside. My sprinkler is hitting these windows and it leaves really bad hard water deposits. I don't want to do it. So what did I do? I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on how to wash windows and then I ordered cool supplies to do it. 
cool supplies and a good podcast to listen to while I do it. And then I'll take some pictures of it to make myself feel good. That's how I'm going to motivate myself. That's an executive function skill. A lot of our students need help developing that type of executive function skill. They also may lack an executive function skill of managing their materials or managing their supplies or managing their time. And so we have to look at, are they lazy or do they need skill development? Are we consequenting them? Are we holding them accountable? You can't change kids, right? You can't take your kid who doesn't like to do homework and turn them into a kid who loves to do homework. They have to do that for themselves if it's ever going to happen. And it might not. I didn't like liver when I was growing up and I still don't like it. There was nothing my mother could do. One night we ate it. She told me it was pork chop. I was not fooled. So you're not going to necessarily change the kid. But what you can do is hold the child accountable. And as long as you are consistently holding the child accountable, that's really what you can do. So what is problematic, though, is holding kids accountable is really hard on parents. Holding kids accountable means that you can't always do what you want to do because you're having to sit there holding that kid accountable. And especially if holding them accountable involves taking away of devices because then they want you to entertain them. But you're not the cruise director. You don't have to entertain them. Kids are capable of entertaining themselves until we take that skill away from them, which is part of what makes them lazy. Another thing, if I have a kid who I feel like I'm worried about laziness is I'm going to look at, are they getting enough gross motor exercise? Are they physically strong? Are they getting good nutrition? Are they eating well? I'm going to make sure their diet and exercise are where they need to be and they're getting good sleep. Those three things. And then fourth, that they're getting time outside. Um, I want all those things in place. All those things need to be looked at. And then lastly, I would want them to be seeing work modeled and not just that the parent is not just binge watching Netflix or lately I've been binge watching the white queen on stars, but um, because I'm a sucker for British history, but not just that they're not watching us binge watch stuff, but that they're seeing us find joy in our work that we're being open about the value that we see in the work, right? Like, oh, I just finished doing this and it feels so good to like stand back and look at the counter and it's all clean and clear and all the dishes are put away. And it just makes me feel like, oh, you know, when Febreze first came out, it didn't have a smell. It took away odor, but it didn't smell good. And when they tested it, people didn't like it because they felt like it didn't do anything. And when they, so they added a scent to it. And in the ads for Febreze, in the early ads, they had a, a woman stereotype, but they would have a woman spray for bees and then stand back and like survey her living room with satisfaction. And that's kind of what we're going for. We're going for that. Ah, oh, I did a good job. And I think a lot of times we need to celebrate the small wins. And what happens a lot of times that demotivates our kids is that we have them do a task and then we just move them right to the next task. All right. Math homework's done. Now it's time for your language arts homework. Instead of doing some kind of yes, you know, celebration, do a little dance, play a little song, eat a little snack, run around the block, have a dance party, right? Like do something to celebrate what was, what just was achieved and accomplished. It's very demotivating if a kid is expected you to sit there and do homework and then they're just due from assignment to assignment and the whole reward is that they get to put it in a backpack. Like that's, that nobody wants that. Like I cook dinner. I want somebody to tell me it tasted good, right? Like, so we need to make sure that we're, we're feeding that and that we're modeling that. All right. Last question of the night. This parent, the, the question was really good and I thought I had copied it, but I hadn't. And so I'm giving very, I'm not giving, um, I'm not giving this question its justice, but the question was about a gifted kid who um, takes a lot of accelerated reader tests and then likes to brag about how many points they have. Again, the question was worded so much better than this, but let me just get out there how much I loathe accelerated reader. I hate accelerated reader with a passion that burns in me. I, I hate accelerated reader with the force of a tsunami. I, if I could get accelerated reader out of schools single-handedly, I would do it. I have a friend 
who wrote on her website about how she hated Accelerated Reader and employees of Accelerated Reader commented on her post, not identifying themselves as Accelerated Reader employees to like badmouth her, but she went and looked them up on LinkedIn and saw that they work for Accelerated Reader. And since that, so then I wrote an article about why I loathe AR. I hate Accelerator Reader. So you can go read about why I, all the reasons I hate it, but I hate it. The biggest reason I hate it is that it takes something that is already beautiful and wonderful, which is reading, and it turns it into this, it just minimizes it into this points. Like, and the way they calculate the points is so stupid. And I hate, I hate it. All right, that aside, what do you do about this? I'm going to look at a bigger, I'm not at all surprised that teacher likes books and I feel the exact same way about Accelerated Reader. So, and it tells you something if two teachers who teach language arts feel the same way about this, right? Okay. What would I say? I think that celebrating wins is awesome, even if the win is Accelerated Reader points. And it's not necessarily bragging to be honest about what you've achieved, even if I think it's worthless, like Accelerated Reader. We may have to, though, take time to explain how things can come across and role play. So the danger is if the kid is saying it in a way that's like, I got these points and uh, like with some either mannerism or voice tone that's implying, and because of that, I'm better than you, or what did you do, like in some kind of challenging way. And so we need to role play that. We need to role play, like, how can you share, like, who would be appropriate to share with? And then how could you share it in a way that comes across as celebrating your accomplishment, but not braggy? So if you know that you have a friend who's struggling, you guys, I can't even use Accelerator Reader as the example because I hate it so much. Let me use something else. Let's just talk about um, like grades on a math test, right? Like they've been trying to get better at their at their math facts practice. All right. Okay. So you're not going to go up to the kid who you know is failing all their math facts practice and tell them, you know, I got a 99. I got a 99, right? There's a way to say it. And there's a person to say it to. So you are going to have to role play. That. Another thing I would suggest is connect things that have no value, like accelerated reader points. And schools try to put value on accelerator points. You can save up 4 billion points and have lunch with the principal. Okay. Um, so now you're rewarding a reward that was already a reward. Anyway. Okay. Um, I need to do a whole video just about Accelerator Reader um, and see if their employees like comment on it. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you can do is connect it to some kind of social emotional learning. And what I mean by that is saying like, OK, and this is what I actually suggested to the dad that was in a in a parent meeting I was doing. Um, and the dad, I think it was a dad at, asked about this. And the thing I suggested to the parent was maybe the parent could connect it to something good in the world, right? Like, so for every point the child earns in AR, that then they get to donate a penny or a nickel or a dime, however many points we're talking about and what the family's budget is to a charity. So then the child is infusing it with meaning. So that that's what I would do in that case. Role play appropriateness and decide who it's appropriate to share with. And um, also make sure that they know how to share without sounding braggy, right? There's a big difference. And I think it is a good thing for gifted kids to celebrate their wins. I don't think it's fair that gifted kids are the ones who don't get to say what they like to do and what they what they were good at and what they achieved, right? We don't make Michael Phelps hide his gold medals, right? And, and it's the same. All right, you guys, thank you so much for your participation tonight. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. So I will be back next month for office hours. Now, I will tell you guys, though, next month, office hours are going to be, I'm not sure when. I am having surgery on my Achilles on the 22nd. And so my normal office hours would have been the 24th, which is Thanksgiving. And I'll also only be two days out for Thanksgiving. But the week before, 
I'm out of town. So we may be doing like very late November. Normally I do a Thursday night, but I might be doing a Wednesday night. For those of you who got on late, there is absolutely a replay. This will this video will stay up on my Facebook page and it will be on my YouTube channel. I don't take it down and they'll be there in just a second. So you can watch them. And that's it. So thank you so much. I will see you next month. Same bad channel, different bad time. And just if you're not subscribed, go to giftedguru.com slash subscribe. Sign up for the email list. I always send the links out to my email list. So thank you all so much and have a great night.